All right, so we've uh, talked about the Greco-Roman context to the New Testament. We've talked about the Jewish context to the New Testament. We've talked about basic facts regarding the New Testament, and we've talked about basic facts regarding the Gospels. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to start by discussing the very first Gospel that was written which is the Gospel of Mark. Mark comes second in the New Testament, but critical scholars, modern historians, for various reasons you can read about in Ehrman's book, are convinced that Mark came first. In the early church, uh, many people thought Matthew was written first. People didn't pay a lot of attention to Mark, believe it or not, in the early church because they assumed that Mark was simply the Cliff Notes version of Matthew and perhaps also Luke. So the assumption was, why read Mark when most of what's in Mark shows up in Matthew anyway? But scholars today are very, very interested in the Gospel of Mark because if you're a historian, you do have to work under the, the assumption that the earliest text is the closest to the events you're trying to understand or to the person that you're trying to understand. So what most people do is they turn to the Gospel of Mark, they read the Gospel of Mark and assume that this particular text contains some of our earliest evidence of who the historical Jesus was. Now, we're not going to get into the historicity of Mark too much in this lecture. We'll save that and we'll save discussions about the historical Jesus for later on in the course. What we're going to do right now is simply talk about Mark as a text. So it doesn't matter really when Mark was written or who wrote Mark. We'll talk about that briefly. But what we're concerned with is if you just look at Mark as a literary text, what is it about? What is it saying? What is it not saying? And again, it doesn't actually matter. It doesn't actually matter if you look at Mark as a final product, as a literary text as we now have it. It really doesn't matter who wrote it. It really doesn't matter when it was written. If we're just trying to figure out, well, what what is this book? What is this gospel basically say? Um, you can do that without having to know, in fact, who actually wrote it, etc. But if we were going to look at some of the earliest traditions about Mark, the early church, and when I say early church, I'm talking about the church starting in the second century and going on through the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. The early church, starting about a hundred years after the death of Jesus, said that the Gospel of Mark was written by a man named John Mark. And the way this tradition worked is... John Mark, whoever that was, and we really don't know anything about him, John Mark was thought to be the personal secretary of the Apostle Peter. If that's the case, then it means John Mark had direct access to somebody that had direct access to Jesus. And if you remember back uh, a few lectures ago, one of the criteria for uh, one of the criteria for saying this book is in, this book is out of the canon is can you come up with a tradition that says the book was written by somebody very close to Jesus or somebody who was very close to a direct follower of Jesus? And that's that's what the whole tradition about John Mark does is it says John Mark was Peter's personal secretary, so John Mark went and asked Peter, Jesus' right-hand man, the very famous disciple, Apostle Peter, who was Jesus, what was going on, tell me the story, and just wrote it all down right from Peter's mouth. So even though Mark is traditionally written by this guy, John Mark, the idea in the early church is that John Mark got all of his information directly from Peter. The problem with this is the first time we hear about John Mark and the possibility that John Mark wrote this text is in the second century or perhaps a bit later. In other words, this was not the original tradition of the text. It, it's, it's added as a tradition to the text probably to stabilize the text and to give the text some kind of authority. As 
I've already shown you, and as I, I've, I've said before, if you just read these texts and take Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but in this case, case Mark, if you just take it as it is, the author of Mark never tells you who he is, nor does the author of Mark write in the first person. These Gospels are all written in the third person. It's almost as if the writer doesn't want you to know who they are, or it's just not of major concern to them if you know who they are or who they are not. So scholars today will say nobody knows who wrote Mark. It's an anonymous text. That's really not that big of a deal. Uh, in fact, maybe because the subject matter of the Gospel of Mark is Jesus, um, maybe the author didn't think that they were worthy enough to even say who they were. Who knows? But the most we can say if we were actually looking at the text is that this is a text written in Greek. It's written by an educated Greek-speaking follower of Jesus. Like I said, they've had some type of rhetorical education, some type of grammatical education. They might be bilingual. They probably are. But all we do know is that they know Greek and they can read and write in Greek. And if you remember from uh, the last uh, class that we had, I said that the literacy rate in the ancient world on a good day is 10%. This means Mark, whoever Mark was, and I'm going to keep calling him Mark just for simplicity's sake, was an educated individual that was part of the 10% that could read and write. Jesus and his first followers, and we talked about this um, in our last class, were lower class, uneducated peasants. Even the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13, says that about the earliest followers of Jesus. So whoever this was writing this text knew Greek, might have known some other languages, and most scholars think that Mark was written between the years 65 and 70. And we discussed this last time. This would mean that Mark is written 35 to 40 years after the life and death of Jesus. It's, it's written 35 to 40 years after the events that it recounts. And it is our earliest of the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the earliest. Part of why, and again, Ehrman goes over this more in his textbook, but one reason why scholars think Mark is written between the years 65 and 70, is he seems to know as an author, and I'll, I'll show you this later on, it occurs in Mark chapter 13, he seems to know as an author that the Jews have been in a war with the Romans, and that the Romans have destroyed the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In fact, what he does, which is very, very clever, is he puts a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 into the mouth of Jesus. Um, whether Jesus actually said this or not, who knows, but it becomes a major part of Mark's narrative. So one of the things Mark does is he narrates an event that started 35 years after the death of Jesus, but puts it back in Jesus's mouth. And again, we'll, we'll come back to that here in a moment, but that is one of the reasons why scholars think this text was not written during the lifetime of Jesus because it refers to events decades after the life of Jesus and his followers. Well, putting all that aside for a moment, if we just turn to the text of Mark, the very first chapter of Mark, so if you see here Mark 1, 1, Here's what that means. The first one, at least th this is how Americans and Canadians um, talk about texts uh, in the Bible. Mark is obviously the name of the text. The big one, the first one, and usually in Bibles that you're reading, you'll see a number that is in bold print. That first number, Mark 1, refers to Mark chapter 1. And if you turn to most Bibles, like I said, the number 1 there indicating chapter will be in some sort of bold black print or bold red print or something like that to set it off from the other numbers. The smaller numbers that are not in bold print are the verses. So when somebody says Mark chapter 1 
colon one, what they mean is read Mark chapter one, verse one. If they say something like Mark one, colon one dash three, it means Mark chapter one, verses one through three. So in Mark 1, 1, the author of Mark tells you exactly what this book is about. He starts out by saying, this is the beginning of the gospel or the good news, another word for gospel, of Jesus Christ or Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So right away, the, the author of Mark starts his account, not like how we as modern people would start an accurate biography of a person. He does not start by saying, in the year whatever, a child was born in this city to these parents or something like that. He starts off just telling you, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In a way, this is Mark's thesis statement. This entire work is about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And everything else Mark is going to do, from this chapter to the very last chapter of Mark, is try to convince you that Jesus is the Messiah and he is, in fact, the Son of God. That's it. Now, that seems simple enough until you start breaking some of this down. The word Christ is a Greek word, Christos, and it's spelled in English C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S. That's the Greek word Christos from which we get Christ. Uh, Christ is not Jesus' last name. In fact, in most cases, when you see this term Christ in the New Testament, the way you should read it is Jesus the Christ. It's, it's a title for Jesus. In Hebrew, the word is Mashiach. It simply means Messiah. Uh, so if you say Messiah or you say Christ, you're talking about the same thing. Christ is the Greek way of talking about this Hebrew concept of Messiah. As a Jew, if you were speaking Aramaic or speaking Hebrew, Messiah simply means the one who is anointed. There were a lot of Messiahs in Israel's history, in ancient Jewish history. Kings could be anointed. Foreign leaders who came and freed the Jews from captivity could be the anointed one. So this is not a magical term and it's not a special term. It, it does start to have some different ideas associated with it and new connotations during the days of Jesus. But, but basically, when you say Jesus the Christ or Jesus the Messiah, all you're saying is Jesus who is the anointed one. But here's Mark's problem. A lot of people are apparently questioning when Mark writes whether or not Jesus can actually be the Messiah. And you might say, well, well wait a minute, why, why would they do that? What's the big deal? It's actually not that big of a deal to claim that you are the Jewish Messiah. Lots of people did it before Jesus and after Jesus. It's also not a gigantic issue, it's more of an issue, but not a gigantic issue to even say you're son of God and all that sort of stuff. But there is no tradition that scholars know of in Judaism during the time of Jesus of a Messiah who is supposed to suffer and die. In other words, if, if you're a Jew, like Jesus and his followers, what messiahs are supposed to do, if they really are the messiah, is they are supposed to triumph over the enemies of the Jewish people. They are not supposed to die at the hands of the enemies of the Jewish people. In the first century, the enemies are the Romans. And if you know your basic story of Jesus, Jesus is crucified by the Romans. He's sentenced to death by the Romans. That's not supposed to happen. In fact, if you die at the hands of the Jewish enemies, the Romans, and you don't triumph over them, then you're a failed Messiah. So what Mark is trying to do is flip all of this. He's trying to say, yeah, I know that, but the truth is Jesus is the Messiah precisely because he suffered and died at the hands of our enemies. Now, this is an uphill battle for Mark. I mean, this is like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill. Uh, 
because again, there is no tradition at all of a Jewish Messiah who wins by suffering and dying at the hands of the Romans. So all throughout Mark, this is what Mark is trying to do. He's trying to say, look, Jesus is the Messiah and he's the son of God. But that doesn't mean what you think it means. If you think it means the Messiah triumphs, you're wrong. What it means is the Messiah is supposed to die and suffer. And so if there was ever a bumper sticker for the Gospel of Mark, it's something like Jesus is the Messiah precisely because he is the suffering Messiah who died. Mark is very, very tragic in how it presents Jesus. It's all about a suffering and dying Jesus who has to suffer and die in order to, to win. So to prove this, Mark starts out by telling us all kinds of things about Jesus. If you, if you notice from reading Mark, there is no birth story. Mark doesn't really care about Jesus' upbringing, his family, all that sort of stuff. The action in Mark starts when Jesus is an adult, and it, it moves very, very quickly. One of the things Mark likes to do is say, immediately, 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 this happened, then this, then this. So Mark starts out trying to tell you as a reader stories about Jesus that are to convince you that, of course, Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. One of the first things he does is he talks about Jesus being baptized by John. This occurs in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And then John appears, and John baptizes Jesus. The next thing that happens, and this is still in chapter 1, is Jesus goes into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan, and he overcomes these temptations. He then moves on and he starts healing people in the region of Galilee, where Jesus was likely from, this northern region around Lake Galilee in uh, modern-day Palestine. He then starts calling his first disciples. After he heals some people, he starts exercising demons from people. Well, what's, what's so odd about this is here's Jesus. He's, he's running around doing all of these wonderful, great things. And yet, no one seems to understand who he is. And this is one of the conundrums of Mark, that Mark shows you, here's Jesus, he was baptized by John the Baptist, he overcomes temptations from the devil, he's healing people, he's exercising demons. But then you start to get this feeling that nobody knows who this guy is. And this is kind of one of the, the, the great sort of literary devices that, that Mark uses throughout his gospel. That, well, yeah, Jesus is doing all these things, but for some reason, even the people closest to him don't get it. So, if you look over in Mark chapter 3, I mean, the list of people that don't get it, and the list of people that reject Jesus is, is pretty overwhelming. Uh... In fact, there's, a, there's a, a story that's told in Mark chapter 3, um, starting at verse 20, 21. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Bilzebul. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. He, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan, this is Jesus talking, has risen up against Satan against himself and is divided. He cannot stand because his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first trying, tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
And then they said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, standing outside. They sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who were sitting around him, he said, Here, you are my mother, you are my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This is an absolutely tragic story here in chapter 3, starting at verse 20 and going to the end of the chapter. Jesus' family, who, by the way, nobody's named in this. You, you, you don't hear his mother being called Mary in this text. She doesn't have a name. His mother, his brothers, his sisters think he's insane. They're trying to restrain him. They're trying to stop him. The Jewish leaders reject him, saying he has a demonic spirit called Beelzebul. Later on in, in Mark chapter 6, we see this same kind of thing. Starting at the very beginning of Mark chapter 6, Jesus goes back to his hometown, his hometown of Nazareth. And nobody will listen to him. Nobody will believe him. He left that place, writes Mark, and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where does this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he couldn't do a deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Here you have a story of people from his hometown saying, This guy can't be this smart. We know who he is. He's a carpenter, which is a uh, a very pejorative term, by the way, in the ancient world. He, they're basically saying, Jesus is a manual laborer. If you are a manual laborer in the ancient world, you are looked down upon. You are part of the lower classes or even the lowest of the lower classes. And here the people are saying, we, we know this guy. We know his mother. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. And they just reject it, even though he's here doing miraculous things, and saying things that are astounding people. Later on in that same chapter, something very strange happens. The disciples themselves are confused about who he is. Um, in fact, all the way over, not just in chapter 6, but in chapter 8, he has to say to his disciples, he has to ask his disciples, do you not yet understand everything that I'm doing? So there's this, there's this thing going on in Mark, this, this, this very interesting literary device where Jesus is doing all this great miraculous stuff, healing people, casting out demons, you name it. But his family doesn't seem to understand him. His own Jewish leaders think he has a demon. His... Friends and neighbors from his hometown reject him. And then his own followers, who have presumably been walking around with him watching all of this happen, don't get it. I mean, th that's kind of a big theme of Mark, of people that are closest to Jesus don't seem to have any clue who he is. In fact, scholars sometimes call this the messianic secret in Mark. Because the, the identity of Jesus, it, it's... If it's being kept secret or people just don't know who he is. And it's, it's one of these things that's puzzled scholars for a very, very long time. Of why is this going on? Well, the strange thing, and just to add to this, and this, this to me says that whoever wrote Mark, I mean, that this was very carefully crafted, that this story was very carefully composed and put together in the way that it's put together for a reason. First of all, a few people do know who Jesus is, even though Jesus is running around and most people don't even seem to understand him. 
Well, one of the first individuals who knows who Jesus is, is God. God is a character in the text of Mark, believe it or not. In Mark chapter 1, verse 11, when Jesus is being baptized, a voice comes from heaven, presumably God's voice, and it says, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Remember, one of the things Mark wants people to understand about Jesus is Jesus is the son of God. Well, God seems to know that. You are my son. The weirdest thing is that these demons that Jesus exercises from people, they know who he is. So, for instance, um, you see a number of places where Jesus will stretch out his hand and uh, exercise uh, a, a demon and the demon will claim who Jesus is, proclaim, I should say, who Jesus is, and Jesus turns around and tells them to knock it off and keep their mouth quiet. In fact, in chapter 1, if you just go to verse 21, here's a classic story. They, Jesus and the disciples, went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in, in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So here's a demon telling Jesus, I know who you are. But Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And his fame began to spread throughout the region of Galilee. So you have this strange thing going on in Mark. God knows these demons Jesus is running around blasting out of people. They know. Mark, the author, clearly knows, and Mark's let you in on it. He's told you as the reader or the hearer, here's who this guy is. But all throughout the text, well, I should at least say in the first half of the text, nobody gets it. His parents, the Jewish leaders, or I should say his mom and his brothers and sisters, because his dad is never mentioned in the text, uh, his, uh, his own disciples and friends, that he has back in his hometown of Nazareth. Have no idea who he is. But then something strange happens in the Gospel of Mark. And it happens almost right smack in the middle of the Gospels, or, or of the Gospel of Mark. There are 16 chapters to the Gospel of Mark, and about midway through chapter 8, we get this story that actually, if you really sit down and think about it, doesn't make a lot of sense. And it also is a bit disturbing. In Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 22, the story is told about Jesus curing a blind man at Bethsaida. But if you pay close attention to this story, something is really problematic about this story. But, but it's actually important for what Mark is trying to do. They came to Bethsaida, this is Jesus and his disciples. Some people brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he looked intently, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Then he sent him away to his hometown, saying, Do not even go into the village. Now, I say this is a strange story because this story is retold in other Gospels. When it's retold, Jesus heals a person once and they're healed. If you read this story carefully, Jesus has to heal this guy twice. 
And some people have thought, that's really strange because why can't Jesus get it right on the first shot? Well, Mark is doing something here that's part of his literary strategy. He needs the blind man to be gradually healed. His sight is gradually restored because what's going to happen after this story is very slowly, very gradually, people are going to kind of get who Jesus is. Or at least they're going to understand it a bit better, just like the blind man who's gradually starting to see. So what, what Mark does with this miracle is he says, okay, I'm going to take the story of Jesus healing the blind man and use that as a literary motif for what's about to happen from here on out. All along, people haven't understood Jesus, but now some people are gradually going to start getting it. And in fact, what happens next is Jesus' right-hand man, the Apostle Peter, St. Peter, whatever you want to refer to him as, he finally gets it. And he says what Jesus has wanted him to say all along. So starting at verse 27 of chapter 8, right after the story of the blind man being healed, Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Fascinating question because Jesus is just about, what he's doing is he's getting ready to test his disciples to see if they can get the answer right. Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah and still others that you're one of the prophets, talking about the prophets in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Jesus turns and asked his disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, he kind of blurts out and he gets it right. You are the Messiah. Well, it's about time that Peter gets this right. And again, strange thing, Jesus turns to Peter and sternly warns Peter and his disciples, don't tell anyone about this. So he gets it right. You are the Messiah. This is something Mark has been waiting for people to understand. Peter finally gets it. But what's so crazy in Mark is that right after Peter says this, he gets it wrong. In other words, he has the answer right, but he has the wrong definition of the answer. It's a very important thing. You, you can sometimes know what the answer is to a question, but not know what the answer means. And this is what's going on with Peter. So right after Peter says, you're the Messiah, the story goes like this in verse 31 of chapter 8. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of these things quite openly. In fact, one of the things Jesus likes to do is he likes to use this title, Son of Man, for himself. We'll talk about that later because it's an apocalyptic title that refers back to the Old Testament prophet Daniel. So when he says, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, he's talking about himself, and he's talking in code in a way that Jews would understand what he means. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, essentially, Peter is telling Jesus, you're wrong. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. To be fair to Peter, Peter is being a really good Jew. Peter has figured out, I get it, you're our Messiah. And then Jesus turns around and says, right, and as your Messiah, I am going to suffer, be rejected, and die, and I will come back. But Peter as a good Jew in the first century, doesn't know what this is because there is no concept of a dying, rising Messiah. I mean, so this, this, is, this is an argument that Peter and Jesus are having about what does it mean to be the Messiah? Peter says, it doesn't mean that, and Jesus says, yes, it does. So the, the strange thing here is P Peter knows who he is, but he doesn't get Jesus' definition of what it means to be the Messiah. So 
From here on out, you, you really get the sense that Jesus is the Messiah, but he's defining that term differently from how any other Jew was defining it. Because the way he's defining it is the Messiah has to suffer and die in order to triumph. But nobody gets this. So this is, this is Peter's problem in chapter 8. Uh, in chapter 9, verse 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. Verse 32. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. In chapter 10, this same thing occurs in verses 33 through 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, Jesus says, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. And the story goes on, and, and they just don't get it. So from here on out, after the healing of the blind man, Briefly, Peter and his and the disciples seem to get it, then they don't get it, and then Jesus keeps telling them, look, this is what is going to happen to me. Jesus is predicting his death over and over again, and no one gets it. And, and this really, if you think about it, is, is a very, very tragic story that the people closest to Jesus don't understand what he's doing. It was once said by a very famous New Testament scholar, and I think this is a pretty apt description of Mark, that Mark is basically a passion narrative with a very long introduction attached to it. When scholars talk about a passion narrative, passion narratives in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and they all have passion narratives, are those stories about the trial, arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what a passion narrative is. In fact, the word passion uh, comes from patio, which simply is, is a word that means to suffer or suffering. So a passion narrative is a narrative about suffering. And if anyone's ever been passionately in love, they understand the, um, the, the actual meaning of the word passion. It's not necessarily a good thing. Passion can often be suffering. Well, six of Mark's 16 chapters are focused on the last days of Jesus, on the passion narrative of Jesus. So it is more or less right to say, hey, Mark is, is, is a gospel that's a passion narrative with a very, very long introduction. In fact, when you get to the final six chapters of Mark, you see time slowing down, you see... Uh, everything going from immediately, immediately, immediately to now we have six chapters just devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. In Jesus' last days, here's, here's a quick summary of what happens according to Mark. And this is a basic format that will also be followed by Matthew, Luke, and to an extent by John. Jesus goes up to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover meal, to celebrate the Passover feast. While he's there, he spends a week preaching in the temple, and then he cleanses the temple, and he says some things about the temple, which I want to talk about here in a moment, which is probably what leads to his ultimate arrest and trial and crucifixion. He has a last meal with his disciples, which in Mark is a Passover meal. In John, it is not. He's betrayed by a disciple named Judas. He's arrested, he's taken to the chief priests, he's taken to Pontius Pilate, Peter denies even knowing him, again a very tragic element of Mark, and finally he's put on trial in front of Pontius Pilate, in front of a figure representing the Roman Empire, the Roman government, and ultimately Pilate says, all right, well, we're just going to crucify this guy, we're going to get him out of the way. Oftentimes people, you know, wonder, what, why, why was Jesus killed? <laughs> why was he such a threat? Um, we're going to come back to this a lot in this course, but 
I'll just say here, Jesus was not necessarily a nice spiritual guy walking around saying nice, lovely things to everybody. Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. And when you're an apocalyptic prophet, you are somebody who is going around telling your followers and others that the world is going to end and end really, really soon. And if you start saying stuff like that, it means all the power structures that are in the world are going to change. The priests who are in charge are going to be out of work. The Roman Empire is going to be destroyed. So in the background of all of this, when, when, when you, you, you hear Jesus, and I'll show you some examples of this here in a moment, when you start hearing Jesus talk like an apocalyptic prophet, you start to get the idea that, oh, I see why he might have been a threat to people. So even though Jesus is going around and talking about the kingdom of God and talking about forgiveness and all these things and all sorts of lovely spiritual and theological things, never forget that also he's running around talking about the end of the space-time continuum. And he's talking about the judgment of God raining down on the unrighteous, and that includes the Romans. So there's a chapter, and I'll just briefly read you some parts of this. We'll come back to it when we talk about the historical Jesus. There's a chapter in Mark, Mark 13, which scholars often call the little apocalypse. And clear as day in Mark 13, Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet. One of the very first things Jesus does in Mark 13 is what likely ends up getting him arrested and killed. So... In the very first verse of chapter 13, as he came out of the temple, so Jesus is in Jerusalem at the temple of God, where the Sadducees, the priests, would be in charge. One of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Now, that's an apocalyptic statement. That's a prophetic apocalyptic statement. Do you see these stones, these large buildings? Guess what? They're going to be destroyed, is what he's saying. Now, he's saying this openly in the temple. If this was getting around by word of mouth, people might have wondered, is Jesus planning on doing something like the fourth philosophy, for instance, to the temple establishment? Is, is he thinking of having his disciples engage in some sort of violent act against the temple? If you look further on in this chapter, he'll say things like, at verse 24, in those days, this is where he's talking about the end of time. In those days, after that great suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the heavens, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. That's apocalyptic language. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, that he will send out angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. And if you just read through the rest of this chapter, you... You, you start to get that what Mark is doing is he's putting all these ideas into Jesus' mouth that are, are likely about the destruction of the temple by the Romans somewhere in between the years 65 and 70. But if Jesus said some versions of this, even in his own lifetime, this is, this is really problematic because this is a Jesus who's saying, the temple is going to be destroyed someday. This is a Jesus saying, the world is going to end someday when I come back and when I judge it. In fact, if you look down at verse 30 of chapter 13, he says, truly, I tell you, this generation, he's talking to his own disciples, will not pass away until these things have taken place. A very problematic statement because... Jesus' first followers did pass away, and these things had not taken place. But 
all throughout this chapter, I mean, you see these things that really could have gotten Jesus killed and gotten Jesus in a lot of trouble. The temple's going to be destroyed. Judgment is going to come on the earth. This is not the kind of thing, if, if you're the Sadducees, if you're the priests, the, the religious leaders in charge that you want to hear, and the Romans don't want to hear it either because they don't know where this is going. So, Jesus does get crucified. And I, I want to point out a, a couple of things here to you. Um, the only group of people in first century Palestine or in the Roman Empire that have the right to crucify someone else are the Romans. That is the only form of capital punishment that the Romans use. If you're a Jew and you want to engage in some form of capital punishment, the only thing you're allowed legally to do is stone somebody to death. Crucifixion is reserved for the Romans. If you are crucified by the Romans, the, the point of that is to humiliate you and to say to others, Rome found you to be an enemy of the state. And crucifixion was just extremely, extremely graphic and extremely, extremely painful. You can see some bones here that archaeologists found of a foot with a nail through it, through the ankle bone. You can see some other depictions here of drawings of what archaeologists think crucifixion actually looked like. You die uh, if you're crucified from asphyxiation because eventually you're so tired you can't hold yourself up. Uh, it's just a grueling, grueling form and disgusting form of torture. But again, if if you are crucified, the Roman state is saying, we deem you an enemy of the Roman state. So whatever Jesus did, and sometimes I don't think it's entirely clear in the Gospels, he, he did something that ultimately Pilate and the Roman government in Judea in first century Palestine said, this guy deserves to die. So don't, don't just... Don't forget that part of it. It's, it's not like Jesus died simply because he was a nice guy or something like that. Um, he, he, he was saying things, probably a lot of the stuff in Mark 13, that was, was very problematic, both for the Jewish religious leaders and also for the Romans. But ultimately, if you get crucified, that, that's Rome's responsibility. That, that is not uh, something that uh, can be ordered by the Jews. It has to be ordered by the Romans. In all of the Gospels, Jesus, there, there's variations as to what Jesus says when he dies. And in fact, in churches today, especially around Easter time and Good Friday, you'll see this, the, the, the seven last words of Jesus, where all the different things Jesus said from all the different traditions are combined. Um, he says one very important thing in Mark after he is crucified. Uh, starting at verse 33 in chapter 15. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, th this, this might as well be good Greek tragedy. Of Here you have this story of Mark starting out by telling you this is who Jesus is, but everybody's going to get it wrong. His family gets it wrong. The Jewish leaders get it wrong, etc. His disciples start to get it, but then they don't get it. And then he explains it over and over and over again. He gets in trouble. His disciple Judas betrays him. Peter denies him. He's uh, arrested. He's taken before the chief priest. He's taken before Pilate. He's killed, he's crucified, and the last thing that comes out of his mouth when he dies is, God, why have you forsaken me? The entire Gospel of Mark is about the suffering of Jesus. If, if, you, if you ever want to see a very human, tragic Jesus, read Mark. Because at the end of it, he, he has this idea that even God has kind of let me down at this point. So those are Jesus' last words. The strange thing is, right after he dies, the oddest character in Mark gets the punchline of the entire gospel. 
starting in verse 35. So Jesus has just said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. This would be one of the great Jewish prophets. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the Roman centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. And again, this, this is so well crafted by Mark. Uh, so it's kind of like sitting, you're sitting there going, you're telling me that his disciples didn't get it. The Jewish leaders didn't get it, et cetera, et cetera. People from his hometown didn't get it. And here after all of this, finally, finally, it comes out of the mouth of one of the Roman soldiers who likely participated in his crucifixion. This guy was or is the son of God or one of God's sons or something like that. I mean, it, it's it's just... It's, it's almost like Mark has tried to figure out, how, how can I make this story as tragic as possible? Now, the ending of Mark is also somewhat tragic. And throughout uh, church history, various other endings have been added to the original ending of Mark in order to try and clear up any possible misunderstandings. So chapter 16, which the original chapter 16 that doesn't have the shorter ending and the longer ending, is really doesn't give you that much detail about what happened after the death of Jesus when he was buried. So chapter 16 says, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint his body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed, or they were afraid. But he said to them, don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. That's where the actual original Gospel of Mark ends. And again, I say this is tragic because you get this very brief account of, look, he came back from the dead. He's in Galilee. Go find him. And you women, go tell Peter and the other disciples what happened. And their response is to flee in terror and amazement. I mean, you, you almost wonder, did they actually get it? <laughs> did they get what had happened or were they still confused? And what a way to end a story. So the story starts out with, this is the gospel or the good news about Jesus, who's the Christ, who's the Son of God. And it ends with, they were afraid, they were amazed, and they fled. Now, there are two other endings to Mark. And these are, there was a shorter ending and there's a longer ending. And you can read through them um, yourself. But these were not original to the Gospel of Mark. These were added much later by copyists and scribes to the text of Mark. And, and mainly scholars think the, the shorter ending of Mark and the longer ending of Mark were added because these scholars and scribes, um, they were not real happy with the way Mark ended. In fact, the shorter ending reads this way. Uh, so after they were afraid and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So somebody thought that's a better ending than just simply ending with they were afraid. But then there's also a much longer ending uh, in which Jesus commissions the disciples and in which uh, you get the ascension of Jesus into heaven. But that is not how Mark originally 
ended. It ended on this note of terror and fear, which is why many people have often compared it to a kind of Greek tragedy. So basically, if you were going to come up with a one-line statement or two or a one-sentence statement or two from Mark, what you would say is, in Mark, Jesus is the Son of God and he's the Messiah. The problem is nobody understands what this means. Because for Mark, Jesus is the suffering Messiah and the suffering Son of God. And for most Jews in the time of Jesus, almost all Jews, I would say, that is a foreign concept. Messiahs do not suffer. Messiahs do not die. They are supposed to triumph. And what Mark has set out to do is to try and convince you and others who hear his text or read his text that, no, the way you triumph over the powers of darkness, over the Roman Empire, etc., is by being one who suffers and dies and rises again, not one who triumphs immediately over the enemies of the Jewish people. So Mark's story is going to be used by Matthew. It's going to be used by Luke. We'll start talking about this more next Tuesday when we talk about the synoptic problem. But um, what you, you want to think about as a historian is, well, if you were alive 2,000 years ago and you only had Mark, then who would Jesus be? And this is very hard for us to do because we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've heard all kinds of different stories about Jesus that aren't even in Mark. But if you were a follower of Jesus and all you had ever heard or read was Mark, then who would this Jesus be? And remember, Mark historically speaking, is the earliest account. And what we really see in Mark is we see this Jesus who is an apocalyptic prophet that thinks the world is going to end in his lifetime. And he suffers and dies for that very idea.